well, we might as well start. We're a very select little group of people. And so I hope it's going to be a very interactive conversation. Now, um, before, I, before I, uh, we start, let me just introduce myself. My name's Lorna Castleton. I'm Foreign Secretary of the Royal Society. And although there's very few people here, they might still have mobile telephones, mightn't they? So please would you switch those off before we start, because we're actually going to be filmed. There's going to be a webcam, and so um, it's important that you don't have your telephones on. That will upset the elect electronics here. Well, thank you ever so much for turning out on a cold, wet November evening. And thank you, for, thank you particularly for coming. Um, because um, this is a, a new, new type of event for us, but we're celebrating Africa Week this week. Um, we, the, or the Royal Society is celebrating Africa this week. And the programme uh, this week is a, a celebration of our current work with Africa, as well as an opportunity to launch two new flagship programmes which build on existing projects. These two programmes are the Leverhulme Royal Society Africa Award and the Royal Society Pfizer African Academies programme. And if I just say that um, we, we are working in Ghana and Tanzania and the uh, Leverhulme uh, Royal Society Awards will be to foster uh, capacity building uh, by means of research in Ghana and Tanzania. And the Royal Society Pfizer African Academies program is really designed to help academies to, to, um, to adopt measures which, which strengthens them and gives them a much better uh, role in helping to advise government. Now, we work on bottom-up funding schemes between the UK and African researchers and capacity-building projects in partnership with individual African science academies. The aims are to increase excellence in science in Africa, on the one hand, while supporting the provision of evidence-based advice to policymakers by African scientists, predominantly through the forum of their national academies. So our Strengthening the academies, we're trying to improve evidence-based advice uh, by putting in place researchers. We are developing and training people on the ground in Africa. Now, our Africa Week coincides with the annual meeting of the African Science Academy Development Initiative. It's known as ASADI, which is being held at the Royal Society on Tuesday and Wednesday of this week, and it's a program which is run by the U.S. National Academies of Sciences. Now, a comprehensive program of events during this week brings together an exciting and wide-ranging mix of African and non-African science academies, international funding agencies, policymakers, and parliamentarians, with a view to sharing good practice and building sustainable partnerships. Tonight, we are in conversation with Dr. Heba Mohammed. Now, Dr. Mohammed is based at the Institute of Endemic Diseases at the University of Khartoum in Sudan. Dr. Mohammed was awarded the Royal Society Pfizer Award last year in 2007 for her pioneering research into genetic susceptibility to leishmanias, a parasitic disease transmitted by sandfly bites. Her discoveries have increased the understanding of how the disease develops in humans and may help to design therapies which will stimulate the immune system to develop defences against the disease. Dr. Mohammed was uh, awarded £60,000 as, her, her, as uh, uh, the award grant to further her research into this neglected area with the aim of developing a preventative treatment. The Royal Society Pfizer Award was established in 2006 with the aim of helping expand research capacity in developing countries and recognising the valuable research taking place in Africa. Uh, the 2008, uh, 2008 award ceremony is taking place tomorrow night. Now, this evening, our event is chaired by Sir Magda Yacoub, uh, one of the fellows of the Royal Society, but who probably needs a uh, little introduction from me. Uh, but I will say that he was born in Egypt, studied at Cairo University, where he qualified as a doctor in 1957. He was involved in the first 
UK Heart Transplant in 1980, 1980, carried out the first UK live lobe lung transplant and has gone on to perform more transplants than any other surgeon in the world. He is currently Professor of Cardiothoracic Surgery at Imperial College London. Smagdi is closely involved with the Royal Society's international policy work in Africa. His strong sense of social responsibility led him to establish the Chain of Hope charity, which sends teams of medics to the developing world to treat children suffering from heart disease free of charge. I'm now going to hand over to him and uh, have him in conversation with Dr. Mohammed, but at some stage we'll want you to join in and ask some of the questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Castleton, and uh, it really is a privilege for me to be here to join in the celebration of uh, our awardee. Uh, you have heard about her work, but I'm sure all of you, including myself, uh, are anxious to know more about what this work all means and how did it come about. So uh, we welcome you here and congratulations again on your uh, achievement. Um, I would like to start by asking you a simple question. And the question goes like this. Um, how did this all happen? What inspired you to go into science? Why did you do all this? Uh, where are you coming from? Where are you now? And where do you think you want to go? Um, a whole lot of things, forgive me for that. But I'm sure uh, our audience here would like to hear it from you. So can you start from the beginning? Thank you very much. Uh, I would like first to thank the Royal Society for uh, the last uh, year awards and for the opportunity to come here again and to have this conversation with uh, Professor Mike Diago. This is a pleasure. Uh, first to start, uh, I'm Hiba Mohammed. Uh, I was born in a small island, uh, lies on the confluence of the Blue and White Nile in the capital of Khartoum. Uh, it sounds very beautiful. It is. It is uh, a beautiful the, place. Uh, uh, do you remember your childhood? <laughs> I remember it, yeah, very well. So uh, I, I, when I started my uh, studies in University of Khartoum uh, in Faculty of Science, I was interested in zoology and looking for living organisms under microscopes and and then I started my interest in leishmaniasis when I was in Faculty of Science in my fifth year. Can I, can I ask you, why did you go into science in the first place? Okay. I mean, uh, for a young lady growing up in Khartoum, uh, is that the usual thing to do? Uh, it's not the usual thing. For us in Sudan and all, almost in all African uh, countries, people like to go to medicine. It's the first, it's the priority for everyone who takes uh, science as a career. And when I, 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 I've been through the exam, I want to go to medicine. I, I can't lie, but uh, when I been accepted in faculty of science, I, uh, my, my parents uh, convinced me it's nice to be in, a, in, in science and to, to work hard and to, to go in this career rather to be uh, a medical officer like many other people. So when I started... Uh, oh, excuse me again, I mean, science is... Um, you're implying a little bit, mm. but uh, I might strengthen that. It's a bit downgraded. People uh, don't understand what science is all about. Um, and uh, maybe, I mean, you imply as well, I mean, that you wanted to go to medical school, but maybe the second best was science. Uh, medicine, I submit, is also a science. And maybe that takes us to how do you define science? 
for me, to define science is it's a, it's a, a broad word to talk about science because, as you said, everyone could be a scientist. But the, the, the department where, where I started is uh, uh, you start to think about uh, research and what is going in Africa, you think about science and we need research. For, for in Sudan, for example, not all medical officers, they do research, but now they started and now everyone thinks about research is a priority. Okay, let's mm. go back to the word science. Mm. And I think um, you just said very nicely and beautifully that everybody, anybody can do research and that is science and you equated science to research. And I'm just uh, reminded by some philosophers of science, like Karl Popper, uh, who is uh, a philosopher who has influenced the thinking of people uh, in the 20th century. And he defines science, to me anyway, in a very uh, clear fashion. And that was, science was the search for the truth, and that the truth is beautiful. Uh, so that is really quite an exciting thing. And if I may, may just interrupt you a little bit more, uh, I come from Egypt as well, and you come from Sudan, and this Nile thing. And uh, the ancient Egyptians knew about science, I think, I submit, because the goddess of the truth was the most beautiful goddess. So they knew that you have to search for the truth, and the truth is beautiful, and even if it's, not, it's unattainable. So science is really not uh, something which should be downgraded. But as you said, do you think in Africa, science and research, people just don't think about? Actually... Uh, it's true. People that don't think about science. And when I was talking uh, before, like when you look for people who uh, start their career in science, there's few people interested to do science because people think science is not a priority for for us in Africa. People think about disease and how they control disease, but they don't think about the implementation of science and how it could help. And actually, most of the government in African societies, they don't allocate money for research. It's a priority for control now, but no one thinks about what science will, will, will come with. Uh, and, 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 and actually, people think about, for personal uh, thinking, people think it's not rewarding. People think about money and uh, to improve their uh, life uh, quality and think science is not rewarding as a time being. This is the whole story. So it's a big, big mistake that so they don't uh, understand what science is yeah. all about, how important research is. And do you think that is uh, a lack of education um, or a lack of understanding, or um, the Royal Society, for example, has um, a program which is entitled Best Practice in Role Modeling. And uh, role modeling in science is really important, and it could be start at school level. So maybe as children, they're not uh, shown by the role model, the teacher or a scientist they look up to, that science is important. And yet, you defied all that and went on to do science. So that's uh, a great achievement, another achievement from the beginning to go into science. And tell us more how what you have done. Uh, as I said, uh, I was born in Tutti Island, and actually this place in 1988, it was, uh, there was an uh, epidemic of a uh, sort of a disease called cutaneous leishmaniasis. It's a sort of, uh, the same disease, but different phenotype. It transmitted by sunfly, but it affected skin only, and self-healing. And I was living in this island, and most of the people in the island was affected, even a member of my family. So when I was in... Children or adults children, or both? Children, adults, everyone, Everybody. everyone, yeah. 
But when when I started my my uh, dissertation for partial fulfillment in the Faculty of Science, uh, my supervisor he was entomologist. So he asked me, "What what do you want to do?" So I I, I said, "I want to start to think." to look for this sandfly which transmitted this disease to us. So I start to look to the different sandfly and classification of sandfly and so on. So this is when I start to, to think about Leishmaniasis as a disease. And uh, I, I done my dissertation for the partial fulfillment for my fifth year in Faculty of Science. And after that, uh, I got interested because I joined uh, Leishmaniasis research group in the University of Khartoum at Institute of Endemic Disease. And, and the father of Leishmaniasis group is uh, Professor Ahmed Mohammed Al Hassan, who worked a lot in Leishmaniasis. Why is he the father? Because he started this research in Sudan and he's leading our group. He he been working this disease for a long time ago. So And he, the whole institute is dedicated to this particular disease? No. It is Institute for Endemic Disease. Endemic we, disease. we have research in malaria, leishmaniasis, tuberculosis, uh, schizomiasis, many tropical and endemic diseases. But one of them is leishmaniasis. And, and I started to do my master's degree with Professor Al Hassan. And we worked in my island looking for cutaneous leishmaniasis in Tuti Island, the distribution of the disease among children and adults. So we, we made a survey for the whole schools. Uh, students in, in different uh, schools in, in the island and looked for their immune response to the disease and so on. So, uh, so my master's degree wa- also was in leishmaniasis, but it was in cutaneous leishmaniasis. And after I finished my master's degree, while I was writing up my thesis, uh, Professor Hassan came again and he said he got an uh, uh, a, uh, a chance for me to continue my postgraduate study and to do my PhD, and this time in visceral leishmaniasis. And actually, for me, it's, it's, I was uh, eager to go further and to work in this disease because for me, visceral leishmaniasis is the most fatal type of disease, and it affects uh, many people in Sudan. For example. When you look for the disease in endemic areas in eastern Sudan, which is a remote area, inaccessible during rainy season, and people are really marginalized people in this area. The disease kills, uh, in eastern Sudan itself, about 5,000 people die every year. And, and because uh, the place is... And these really, are poor people, as you say, they underprivileged are, and... Uh, they have that problem on top of everything else. Exactly. And even they don't have money to go to the hospital. So most of people die because they, they couldn't reach the hospital before they die. So when he asked me to, to start to do my... Ma- but apart from death, mm. it's also crippling Yeah. for all these people. Exactly. It's a chronic disease is, as well as a killer. It is a killer, yeah. And, and if people not treat it, they die immediately. It's 100% death. If there is no treatment for such disease. Mm. So, uh, as I said, Professor Hassan and his group been working in this place for from 1990s. So, th- th- forgive me for interrupting mm. again. It, you keep talking about Professor Hassan. Mm. Uh, was he your role model then? He is, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> he's somebody you looked up to and say, oh, I'm going to be yes. do yes. something to... That's great. Yes. He, he done a but lot I'm for sure that you are people. now a role model for many other people. But carry on. So, so they started to work in this place in remote area in eastern Sudan for a long time, from 1990s. And actually, they, they worked in two villages in this area with his colleagues. And it was noticed that the, the disease is more severe in a specific tribe rather than others. So my, my, my objective was to, to think about why some people live in the same environment, exposed to the sand fly, and, and exposed to the same uh, environment, but some of them, they cause the disease and others not. So, uh, Can it be familial or just you generalize by saying it affects certain tribes? But what about certain family groups? Okay. Actually, 
the two tribes was a tribe. Most tribes, they migrated and came and settled down in this endemic area. But it was found also within one, one of these tribes, it caused the disease in a very severe form. And the incidence rate is really high comparing with the other tribe. But even when you look for those people, there is clustering of the disease within families. So there is some families they got it, and you have more than two siblings with the same family they got it or more. So it was clear, and, and there is many evidence about the role of genetics for infectious disease. So, so we carried on, and uh, at this point, I joined uh, Professor Blackwell in Cambridge University. Uh, How did you join Professor Blackwell? Was it your initiative or no. Professor Hassan or no. Actually, it's a prof combination? Actually, it was uh, Professor uh, Montasser Taib Ibrahim. He's my supervisor, my, my, my supervisor for my PhD. Professor Hassan is the head of the Leishmaniasis group, and Professor Ibrahim is professor of genetics. So he made the collaboration with Jenny Blackwell. And I started by, uh, I, I applied for a small training fellowship from the WHO, World Health Organization, and I got this uh, grant for uh, six so months. So that was your own initiative, to write to the WHO? Uh, I, I wrote the proposal, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. They gave me the keywords for the research, and I wrote the detailed proposal, and I applied for the WHO, and I got the grant to, to join Professor Gary Blackwell Laboratory in Cambridge for uh, eight months. And, and after that, while I'm doing my PhD, uh, we got an interesting result. So Professor Jenny and Professor Ibrahim in Sudan, they wrote a, a big collaborative research grant and they got funds from the Welcome Trust. So this allowed me to continue my PhD in Cambridge University for the whole three years. And How was Cambridge? Was that a, a nice time? I mean, what do you remember? <laughs> Something uh, exciting or hard work and sweat and toil? It's a place, it's really a beautiful place, a nice place, I like it. I think it's my second home. I like it so much. The group was really good because it's a mixture. We are from more than, I, I'm not sure, it's six or seven different countries. People from India, Brazil, Sudan, and it's a mixture, you know. So the group was really good. But as a work, it's really hard work. So sometimes I stay in the lab until 11 p.m., 12 p.m., because there is a lot of work I have to do, and I have, uh, I have a time limit, and I have to go back home. And, and sometimes, you know, I, I go back home, collect samples, come back again. So it was really hard time, but uh, it was really good because... What was the most enjoyable thing during this period, which you remember as great, wonderful? Actually, for the me, interaction, the... actually, it was the first time for me to interact with people. You know, it was maybe it was my first time to go out from Sudan and to come to Cambridge. So it's the first time to meet people from different nationalities and to interact with people and to know how people. Uh, I, I I learned a lot, and it's the first time to be uh, as independent a person. No one direct you to do this and this. So it was really good. I learned a lot from my stay in Cambridge and, and from my supervisor and my colleague. It was really brilliant. And then uh, you were awarded the PhD, I mean. Yes, uh, it was in 2002. Uh, I, 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 my exam was in Cambridge and uh, it was once one examiner from Sudan and one from Oxford University. And uh, after I got... Both of them were external examiners? One internal from Sudan and one external from Oxford. But Cambridge and Oxford are together? Or no, you? because actually the Welcome Trust Fellowship, it, it, they pay for my, my research work, not for my tuition and, and registration fees in Cambridge. So I registered in Sudan. I see. Okay, and I got external supervisor in Cambridge and internal okay. supervisor in Sudan. Okay. And the exam was uh, following the inverse of Khartoum rules. Did you enjoy the exam? Was that uh, memorable or they gave you a hard time? <laughs> it was. It was really hard time, but it was okay. Because but I think <laughs> there is many people have this question. Should a PhD exam be hard on the student or because you want to develop it or should it be 
easy going or a combination? Actually, it should be. I think a combination. Actually, I think the evaluation of the student uh, usually done from the thesis itself. Mm. The viva itself is like they want to show, they want the student to show how he performed during these years and is he confident about his result. But I think their evaluation is being been, uh, done, already. done already. But the other but, thing about what, what you're going to do next, well, that's what we want exactly. to hear. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so uh, did they give you that sense that uh, the last chapter in this thesis should be future directions. Yeah, that's true, yeah. The, it was a discussion, what is beyond this point? Do what, next. what do you want to do next? Yeah. And to answer this question, it was really good because uh, we wrote a small grant, me and my supervisor in Cambridge, to the Wellcome Trust. And this, uh, it was really good because I've been offered a grant to allow me to go back to my home country and to start as independent scientist. And to, to have a chance to come back to Cambridge like three to six months every year for the whole three years to learn about the most recent technology and to interact with my supervisor and others. So this was really good and this is why my, my start point in Sudan. Because if I, if, if I couldn't get this money, it will be impossible to start research in Sudan. So when I returned back... What, what about the government? Uh, you don't have I, the equivalent of the Medical Research Council or organizations, um, NGOs who fund the research, uh, or they just um, pay lip service. You hear a lot. I'm not uh, just singling out Sudan now. Mm -hmm. Uh, that governments give a lot of lip service without research, there is no progress, da da da, da. But then you don't see um, funding following that. Do you think that's a problem? It's a big problem because there is no money allocated for research. We have a National Research Council in Sudan, but it's like... What do they do? They, Forgive me for asking. They, they try to, to make a collaboration between different universities and they do uh, like uh, small scale research, like, but they don't fund other universities to do research. They have their own staff in this National Research Council. They do some research in different aspects, but it's like it's very, very small money allocated for such research. And even the National Research Council depends on uh, NGOs and uh, international funders. Uh, for us, in University of Khartoum, the university give our salary, but there is nothing for research. But the also, how uh, are you evaluated as a member of staff in the university? They talk about teaching, but do they talk about research? Yes, they talk about research. Even to be promoted from, for example, from assistant professor to associate, you have to have, uh, I'm not sure, 20, 10 to 12 paper in recognized journal and all these things. But there is no money to help people to do research. And most of people in universities, they, they've been promoted because they've been a long time for in assistant uh, status. So they've been promoted after 10 years. But there are some people do some research. In our institute, I think we are lucky because we developed a very good collaboration with different universities outside. And we have, uh, we, it is, I think it is a personal uh, effort. All my staff, they do write proposals and they submit Tell it. Tell us and about your staff. Yeah. OK. Oh. Uh, it's, uh, the institute started in 1993, and we have a department, uh, different departments, departments of immunology, molecular biology, and uh, biology. So we have uh, how many? Emeritus professor, Professor Al Hassan, was the ex uh, director of the institute, and then we have uh, three other professors and one associate and four assistant and three, uh, three or four uh, teaching assistant. So it's your not a group. very big... Uh, what about your own group? My own group, uh, when I returned back to Sudan, I started to supervise a student. So I don't have my own lab, Rotary. I, I still working under the umbrella of my ex-supervisor. But I have my own equipment in the same laboratory. And I have students, so I have three 
master, three master students graduated, they got their degree, and I have seven under my supervision. How many? So seven. in all? On all ten. So that's quite a, a big star. You supervise them all and you look yeah. after them? And I, I am looking now after, after seven, because three, they got their degree. What degree? PhD? No, master degree. Master degree. Mm. And what do they do next when they get their master degree? Some of them are all already employed in different universities. They go back for teaching and they come back to do their PhD. One of them, he started his PhD now with me. Uh, yeah. On the same topic. Yeah. Okay. So have you taken it to the current situation? Are, are we current now or are you still telling us more? <laughs> it's, it's okay, yeah. It's current. The, the, yeah. What do you want to do in the future? Actually, what do you want to do? Uh, not me alone. We, 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 we would like to have a, a solution for the Lashman ISIS problem in Sudan. And as you know, there is no uh, vaccine available for Lashman ISIS. And there is no 100% uh, curable uh, medicine available. So uh, we hope our research will will able to solve this problem and to have yeah, to help people. And that's stimulating the immune system uh, rather than having a vaccine. Because is leishmaniasis mm. peculiar to Sudan, uh, to Sudan or how widespread in Africa it's, and other places? It is spread in different places and it's different forms. For visible leishmaniasis, it found in many, many places like Sudan, India and other countries, yeah. So the, it's affect. It, it's actually it is about twelve uh, million people uh, having leishmaniasis uh, annually, yeah, and three hundred fifty at risk of acquiring disease, yeah. Right. And and annually the death of uh, visceral leishmaniasis is half million people die annually from visceral leishmaniasis. And what is stopping uh, the effort to produce a vaccine? Now there are many uh, groups <laughs> trying to uh, develop vaccines for neglected diseases, yeah. and I guess this is one of them. There is the new um, institute Novartis have established mm. in uh, Siena, mm. uh, next to Florence. Is are they looking in uh, lesbianizers, and should you? sort of stimulate them to do that, or they're focused on things like HIV? Actually, in our institute, we started uh, thinking about vaccine, and we have done our first vaccine trial. And it was- There a, is a vaccine already? No, we, 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 we have done a vaccine trial, but it was, it was in 1998, and, uh, and we, we, we thought about it because when people start working in Eastern Sudan, People came to this endemic area, they came actually from Darfur area, and it was in the 1980s, because after the drought hit uh, Darfur, they migrated and they came to the endemic area. So they were immune and exposed at that time. But some of the other people, when they came to the Eastern Sudan, Darfur was endemic with L major, which is called the cutaneous leishmaniasis, the self-healing type. So the adults, when they came to the endemic area, they were immune and they didn't get the visceral leishmaniasis. So our group started to think about the l major could be protective for the most fatal type, the visceral leishmaniasis. So uh, Dr. Ahmed is here, one of the audience. He's part of this vaccination trial. So they, they, they used uh, autoclaved leishmania major with BCG as adjuvant and they tried uh, phase one and phase two was successful and they tried in the field. But unfortunately, the protection was similar. People got the vaccine and the, there is no differences. So it was not effective. Yeah. So they started the second trial in vaccine trial and they used alum as adjuvant and, and this was really good because it helped to treat uh, another sort of uh, disease we call it post kalazar dermal leishmaniasis. What is, why, where did the term kalazar come from? Kalazar is an Indian, uh, it's Hindu, 
And because the disease was there for a long time, so Kalazar, it means like, I think, black fever. Black fever, black fever yeah. So it's... Why so. black fever? Because they don't know the cause or <laughs> it affects black people or a combination? Or? Become his color is changed. The color changes after yeah. he developed ulcers, black fever. Okay. So so now we, 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 we they used the new vaccine, and there is a sort of disease. People after they got visceral leishmaniasis, they develop skin rashes and macular and papules and in their skin, and they call it post calazar dermal leishmaniasis, and this is. Usually in 60% of patients, after they, they got the treatment and successfully treated it, after six months, they start to develop this sort of disease. And this is like chronic. And they don't respond to treatment. So uh, Dr. Ahmed and others, they use this uh, alum and autoclave leishmania major uh, to treat post calazar dermal leishmaniasis and was successful in treating those patients. So it enhanced the immune system. And because people usually, they, they have different cytokines secreted when they cause the visceral leishmaniasis. But when they injected with this vaccine, they develop, uh, they enhance the immune system to the TH1 response, and they clear the parasite, and they become, yeah, cured. So we, we work on, but still now there is no such vaccine for parasitic disease, you know. What about uh, something related to your own work? Yeah which is uh, stimulating the immune system with a monoclonal mm. antibody or something similar, yeah. or once you find uh, those susceptible, what are you going to do? Okay. For, for us, for visceral leishmaniasis and other infectious disease, it's not like other monogenic, monogenic disease. It's like one single gene-causing disease. It's a polygenic, and, and from my research, we found that there is many genes in the pathway of the immune system are associated with the disease. There is different polymorphism or mutation within these genes. But what people think about infectious disease and susceptibility, people know after the genome completed, genome uh, sequence completed, people will think about individualized medicine and looking for pharmacogenetics. And now we have to think about every individual has its own response towards a specific disease. So I, I found several, several genes has a role in susceptibility to visceral leishmaniasis. But it shows us, it, it's, it's, now it's, it's clear for us there are different pathways we have to follow. We shouldn't concentrate on one specific genes. We but have I several mean, genes. In your process, you actually looked at candidate genes. Yes, yes. And, and is that a drawback or uh, are you thinking about looking in an unbiased fashion hmm. on genome-wide search? We don't, well, don't genome-wide search. I, I started with uh, candidate genes, but we have done genome-wide scan after. You have? Not me. I was a part of the group, but another PhD student. But still, the candidate genes uh, for infectious diseases as general is, I can't say it's obvious, but, but because there is many studies being done in animal model and even in human looking for a specific gene regulating the immune system. So when we choose this candidate genes because we know the function of these genes and how it affects the control of the parasite itself inside the macrophage. So I, don't, I can't say that our choice wasn't good. It was good uh, and we choose the right candidate if you can say the right. But after that we follow it with, with genome scan approach. And, and we found another, uh, different loci also. Uh, in addition to the first loci we found, yeah. It's very exciting, isn't it? It's just like a <laughs> detective story, isn't it? Um, now, tell me, now we're approaching the time when we should ask the audience to come back at you. Um, mm -hmm. the, um, how is the Royal Society Award Pfizer Award going to help you? In what way? Yeah. Actually, uh, it will help me a lot. Uh, when, I, when I found this association uh, with specific candidate genes, 
uh, I want to look for the expression profile because, as I said, we have those people got visceral leishmaniasis, and other people they got visceral leishmaniasis, but they developed to have the postcalazar dermal leishmaniasis, which is these rashes. And 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 I find uh, from the genetic study that one of these candidate genes, the interferon gamma receptor, is is associated mainly with postcalazar. So. When Which I got gene is that? I mean, interferon gamma receptor. Interferon gamma. Receptor. So, so what what I what I'm doing now? I'm looking for the expression profile. Patient with visceral leishmaniasis before treatment, after treatment, and other people who got the post are dermal leishmaniasis, and to see the expression profile. Is the protein is there, or is there is uh, the expression is low or high in different people? So why people got this sort of disease and others they didn't got it? So the money from the Royal Society will help me to, to solve this and to... So you've done your studies at gene level, not at yeah. protein level. No, but now we move so to expression to... level, yeah. Okay. And, and actually, uh, we able from the money from the Royal Society to buy a real-time PCR machine. And this is the first real-time PCR machine in our institute. Mm -hmm. There is two or three in the country, but wasn't... Um, uh, I can't it's say great. they are. Huh? And it's a great time. Uh, it's because a, the price of the yeah. real time PCR <laughs> has gone right down. Yeah. They couldn't have done it before. So, yeah. So, so, so it's, it's, it's really that's, good. Yeah. So it, it will help us a lot to, in Lashmanis' research, this money. Yeah. But if you go to the protein, I'm just mm -hmm. being technical now. Um, what about gene regulation with other things? Yeah. What do you think of microRNA? Uh, yeah. That's something you have to follow as well. Yeah. So we, there is a lot more to do. There is a lot more to do. You need more awards, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Anything you want to tell us now, or I have not asked you, and particularly mm. in relation to the future. Yeah. Uh, yes, I want to talk about the problem-facing research in Sudan, or in African countries like. For example, this award, I've been awarded this, uh, this money last year, but till now we couldn't get the whole sum of money because for the sanction, because we've been sunk by the USA, and uh, even to transfer money from UK to Sudan is impossible. This is the first step. Second step, when we, we try to order some equipment, uh, consumable reagents, any products produced by USA or other countries, we, can, we are not allowed to order it. So you have to do it through sub-dealer. And this takes ages to, to get this. So all this is facing, all our research is facing the same problem. So the progress of research is really slow because the, the, can, the, the canal uh, to provide all this stuff is really blocked. And, and, and it's a really big problem. And the main uh, problem is funding. For me, I was lucky. I got this prize, but my, my it's colleagues... It's not just lucky, because I think you, you made your luck, didn't you? <laughs> uh -huh. But it's still uh, funding is a big problem facing. And the other problem, I think, the, the, the importance of implementation of research. We have the, the, the policy in our countries should be uh, thinking about research as... Uh, uh, as important, and 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 this research should shouldn't be in paper or in shelves. At what it should level? Be I mean, we talked about that, Dr. Mohammed mm. uh, earlier. Uh, should it be at school level, uh, like the Royal Society is trying mm. to do, uh, at policy makers level, at government level? Uh, do you have an academy like the Royal Society, mm. which? stimulate people to say, come on, excellence in science is the way to go? Do you have an academy? We have an academy, yeah. It's, I think it's three or four years old, and they try to do their best to, mm. for people, public, and to show the importance of science. But again, they are facing a problem with funding. So their, their uh, activities is But they know limited. what to do. They know what Forgive to do. Me, right? They are really good people, and they They're know what people. to do, yeah. And for how to, to solve this, I think, as you said, we should start from 
schools, okay, but still we need some scientists or people who know about the importance of science to be as a part of the people who make decision to, to, to help, uh, yeah. Okay, I think now it's the turn. Uh, Professor Kassel, do you want to say something? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? We've got a microphone. I thought, I think, yes, we should open it up now and have, have other people ask questions. One thing I just wanted, I didn't think came out at the beginning, was what was so special about your family that they, they, they were directing a young lady into science? Who's? The your family. family. Yeah. Did they direct you into science or they wanted you to be a doctor? The well, doctor is a scientist, by yeah. the way. But, uh, <laughs> First, they want me to be a doctor, but after I I've been accepted in Faculty of Science, they encouraged me to continue. Yeah. But what? Yeah. Have you? Has she answered your question? Well, I think you know. Don't you see yourself as a role model for a woman to be able to continue in science? I mean, can you not project that more? Can you? I mean. The, Obviously, other school children should be shown what an important subject this is to study and that women can do it just as well as men. Yeah. Yeah. Better sometimes. <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> yeah, uh, to, be, to be a scientist is not an easy job, I think. Uh, it's, uh, for a woman or yeah, for, a for woman. anybody? I don't know for men, but for a woman, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's really it's you need to to spend the whole time in the laboratory seeing and read and 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 sometimes my mom complained because she said why you don't be uh, to to have another career uh, like your cousin she go to the bank and come back and sleep uh, for 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 me come back and I <laughs> still, look what happened to the bank yeah now. you you have to <laughs> you have to sit in the computer to to go to to see what is the new in the literature and to do your work at home. So it is the, so the end when you come back from your uh, laboratory. But it was exciting also. enough for you it to continue. It is exciting. It is exciting. And you will I, continue. I like it. I like it. You are yeah. a role model. <laughs> <laughs> Questions from the floor. Hello. Oh. Hello. Hi. <laughs> um, thank you very much for this talk. It's, it's great to hear about some really novel um, cutting edge you know, techniques being applied to such an important disease like leishmaniasis affecting so many people in Sudan, which is also my home country. Sorry, can you identify yourself Sorry, yes, for my the name's, audience? Um, yeah, my, uh, name's, my name's Halima Amer. Um, I'm also Sudanese. I, um, I studied in Sudan as a child, but um, did my... Um, I, I, I'm a scientist as well. I did my PhD And the question here. is? And the question is... Um, I, I, it's more of a public health question, really, but it's, it's also drawing on something that um, Professor Yacoub said about monoclonal antibodies being a very... I mean, you know, as, as I'm sure you're very aware, they're, they're a fantastic, very exciting um, treatment, but prohibitive, prohibitively expensive in this country, let alone somewhere like Sudan. And in terms of a vaccine, that's something that's very readily accessible. I mean, where do you see the future of technologies um, like monoclonal antibodies? I mean, what place do you see them having in a, in a country like Sudan, is my question. Easy question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, as you said, it's uh, by by by, by uh, coming uh, like when you think about the uh, future, uh, because the technology is growing well, I don't think there will be a problem for Sudan to access uh, such technology or such monoclonal treatment therapy or whatever, uh, and and. If you look for it, for for example, for simple kits now we use it in Sudan. When we started to do our research in molecular biology, for example, the PCR was really a dream for everyone. But now, when you look at uh, for for such technology in Sudan, is available in such laboratory, many laboratories, even for diagnostic. So there is no, I don't think it's impossible to have such uh, in Sudan. Yeah. She answered your question. You satisfied? <laughs> okay. More questions from the floor. 
I have a question, actually, if I've, yeah. I take the microphone handler's prerogative. <laughs> um, I've never heard of leishmaniasis before this event, and I'm amazed that half a million people a year die from it. What, what, what happens when you get leishmaniasis? If I, if I was bitten by a sandfly today, what, what, what would happen to me? Okay. So, uh, for visceral leishmaniasis, actually it's known like one out of ten people bite by sandflies that develops the disease. So the disease is started by people get fever and uh, start to lose weight. And after that, they got uh, what we call spleenomegaly and hepatomegaly, the enlargement of uh, liver and spleen. Because the parasite usually uh, goes to the macrophage and, and reside inside the spleen and liver. So after that, if there is no treatment, people die from the disease. Yeah. It and, spreads all over. Yeah, it's, it's disseminated yeah, in the whole body, yeah. So people die from it. But there is a different sort of disease. In Sudan, 5,000 die. Five, five, one million die from the whole world, from visceral leishmaniasis. In Sudan, in one specific every area. Year. Every year. In Sudan, in 1990s, this disease hit people in southern Sudan. And 100,000 people died from a population of 3,000 people. 300,000 people. So 100,000 people died. So it is fatal if untreated. 100% mortality. Why does it affect the poor people? Actually, Why do they have low resistance? Actually, Maybe if, it, uh, if you're bitten, probably you'd be all right. <laughs> <laughs> no. Actually, it's, it, it doesn't affect only poor people. Even one of our colleagues, he got affected because if you go to the endemic area where sand flies is there and the parasite is there, so the people have uh, have a, there is a possibility to have the disease. But, but why the people, do they get the it people, more frequently? Yeah. Is it because they are bitten more frequently, or because they cannot resist when okay. they are bitten? Yeah, the people in this endemic area they've been bite by sandfly rep repeatedly. Again and okay. again. And again, the most important problem is the co-infection. In, in our endemic area, it's okay. There is no HIV. But in many, many places, when people become immunosuppressed, the disease flare up. So it, is, it goes with the immune system. So there is many problems now arise after the, the high percent of HIV infection. How common is HIV in Sudan? It is Do actually, we know? Actually, because there is no such... Uh, no statistics. Yeah. But it's common. Question there. Two questions. Hello. I work for the Royal Society. And yeah. I was just wondering whether there's no preventative action that can be taken, like with malaria, having nets to sleep in to keep the mosquitoes away? Is there nothing that can be done to keep the sandflies out of yeah. houses? When, when are people? people bitten? During the day, during the night? Yeah. Where does the sandfly lurk? Okay. Where, is, where is it hiding? Yeah. Uh, people start to use the uh, impregnated bed net in this endemic area. It is the same way like mosquito. You can have bed nets. But the problem is, the peak of sandfly is uh, like uh, no, uh, five o'clock uh, this time, evening, and Why early morning. Hmm? Why? It is it nectarial. Just the sandfly is nectarial. It starts after sunset. It, the fly, like mosquito. It's, uh, it's uh, the activity at night, okay? But the problem is people that don't go to bed early, okay? So they don't stick to their beds uh, under their bed nets. So they move and they get by by sandfly. This is a problem. And we tried the impregnated bed net in the endemic area. It was okay, but not for all people. More, maybe for some people who sleep early. And, yeah. Another question? Um, you spoke about the sanctions that you face working in Sudan. And you did your PhD, and you had a grant to mean that you could do it in Cambridge. Were you ever tempted to stay in the UK, what made you go back to Sudan? So, can you repeat the question? Yeah. I, I was just okay. wondering, yeah. and why, why, why did you, why did you have this? Why did you go back to Sudan? Okay. Actually, uh, first of all, I never thought about working abroad. Uh, I live in Sudan. I think. Uh, 
uh, I'm employing the University of Khartoum. And I, I thought, if I go back home, I can transfer the knowledge I got it from Cambridge University. And, and I was really pleased. When I returned back, I, I, I think I helped a lot of people uh, by teaching, by supervising students, and so on. When you are in Africa, you feel the, the real problem. And you know, people need you. So I, I don't like to, to stay abroad. Okay, I can come... so what, was it uh, passion mm. to disseminate knowledge mm. or to fight disease? This or is a, a combination? For both, for both. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, Dr. Mohammed, may I, may I ask you? Um, my name is Michael Patzel, I'm a retired engineer. Um, may I ask you, being a doctor and a research doctor, for once being optimistic, when do you think or how long do you think it may take for you to actually have a breakthrough and have a vaccine or some other means to save all these lives? That's an excellent question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we heard so much about uh, malaria, we're going to be <laughs> defeated next For year, time, all out yeah. malaria. One billion dollars will defeat malaria and it's still with us. And so what's, what are your predictions? Uh, I, I want to be optimistic and I think maybe like 10 years or less. 10 years? Yeah, or less, then or so less. Many be, because I think millions we, of people will die in the meantime. But now we do what we could do. We, we try to prevent people and we try to treat people immediately. We, we usually we go to the area where people are uh, suffering. We, we don't want them to come to us. That's what we could do now. But we're working on vaccine also, and I think we are working on the right track. And there is many groups in, in different places, in different laboratories, working hard to get such vaccine. But the but problem is, is it effective vaccine or not? This is the problem, yeah. Do you think 10 years is an optimistic? It is not, but uh, in science, 10 years it sounds like this. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, my name is Virginia Lowe, and uh, biology was my worst subject at school, and I haven't done much with it since. But um, I'm very interested in the idea of differences in immune response. And um, are you, I'm, I'm not clear from what you've said, are you also looking at people who seem to be surprisingly unsusceptible to the infection? Um, or just at the ones who, the difference between, uh, just the ones who are particularly susceptible? Okay. And um, might there be implications for um, other, um, other illnesses in the different responses? Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, in my study, I looked for the most susceptible group. But for the other resistant group, we looked for their immune response. We, we met... We, we were sure they are being bite by sandfly because we have uh, a skin test like the, we call it Leishmanian skin test. And, and when we done it, we, we know those people are exposed and they haven't developed the disease. But when I worked, I worked in the most susceptible group, looked for different mutation and polymorphism in their immune regulatory genes. But now, well, I hope so, I, I wrote a grant for the Welcome Trust. And now I want to look for the, the other group of people. To, to see why they are resistant. If we can find uh, a marker for resistance, it will be really good. So this is what I applied for, and I'm waiting for their decision. A very good question. <laughs> you should be a co-applicant on the world. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? We are approaching uh, the limit. Yes, sir. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Patrick Kelly, and early in my uh, career as a public health physician, I did a lot of work on leishmaniasis in Central America. Uh, I'm not particularly familiar with it in, in Africa, but um, I, would, I wonder if you could comment a bit about how it's treated uh, in Africa. Um, you cited very high death rates. Is it because they're not getting adequate treatment, or is it because uh, the treatment is ineffective? Um, in, in Central America, they made great use of uh, antimony compounds, uh, but they were very 
uh, very difficult to use because you needed to have people take injections for for many weeks. Yes, yes. Um, is, is that uh, feasible in Africa? And there were also, for cutaneous forms, a variety of interesting treatments using heat therapy, uh, which was much less expensive. I, I'm just wondering if you could comment a bit more about that. Okay. Uh, for, for, for treatment, uh, we use the same compound, antimony compounds, bentostan, uh, sodium stevoglutonate. And as you said, it's really difficult for people in remote areas to do it because it's injection for 30 days. Uh, but most of people die, they don't, uh, people who are not treated. But we, we start to develop some resistance to the, this type of uh, drug, but uh, it's not that uh, big, uh, it's not a, a very large percent of people develop resistance. In India, it is about 6% develop uh, resistance to bentostan. In Sudan, it's not the same case. But people who die, they don't have access to the drug itself. It's expensive, and they don't have money even to reach the hospitals. So this is, I think, most of people die for, from, yeah. For cutaneous leishmaniasis, it's, as I said, self-healing, and most of people leave it as it is, because it's, if, you got it, if people get the uh, cutaneous is life protective, so they don't uh, treat it. But some people, when they, it's complicated with secondary infection, they usually go for antifungal and antibacterial treatment, and this is what they do for cutaneous leishmaniasis, yeah, like ketoconazole and others. Yeah. You yes. say yes. if they get to the hospital, mm. will they invariably get the right treatment? Yes. You have up. enough supplies yeah. in the hospital. Yeah, we have. Yes. Just to follow up, is it, um, you're right, in Central America, people mm. also um, found it to be generally a self limiting disease, mm. but it was also at times rather stigmatizing because you'd have these big ulcers on your face. Yeah. In, in your country, um, is, is that a stigmatizing situation? Do, do people. Uh, are they shunned in any way when they have lesions like that? Uh, no, but actually, so when people go to doctors, they ask them just to to clean it and to make sure it is clean, uh, and and it heals. Yeah, it's not uh, that sort of diffusing like in other places. It's a localized lesion, but usually people care about diabetic people and others, so uh, they give me them treatment immediately. But most of people, they even go to doctor. For example, when, when it was in my home island, people, they don't uh, care, and they don't go to the doctor because they just uh, try to make it clean, and, and that is all, unless it has become, yeah. But it's not a stigma. A big, no. People say, oh, you've, you've got this thing. No, I don't think so. How, how are we doing? <laughs> and so I think we should really thank uh, um, Hiba Mohammed and Professor uh, Magda Yukub for entertaining us this evening. Um, thank you for taking part. Thank you very much for coming. And so may we just thank them properly for having been here. Thank you.